Hello, friends, and welcome, or welcome back. This is the Legacy Bible Podcast, the place where you will hear lessons from the Bible, from the tape archives of the Fellowship Bible Church, right, in Joliet, Illinois, and it will be taught by our pastor, the Reverend Chuck Rains. And today, we're going to be having something from a uh, February 22nd, 1998. It's titled, He Must Increase and I Must Decrease. So he meaning who, do you think? The Lord Jesus Christ, yes. He must increase, so I must decrease. So we'll be getting to that. That sounds like a pretty good uh, message. We'll be getting to that, but I just want to ask... Uh, the pastor, uh, one thing, um, you know, pastor, uh, when you read the newspaper, uh, what is it that you think about? The centrality of the work of the Lord Jesus Christ for our salvation uh, came to me as I was thinking of something that I had read in the newspaper recently. A law has been passed in Germany which makes the film Schindler's List required viewing for high school students. They cannot graduate without viewing that film. Now, many of the teachers in Germany go beyond that law in what they do in the class before and after that viewing of the film. They have discussion groups. Many of the students are asked to write papers discussing the evils of the Nazi regime of the Third Reich. The value of each person, regardless of race or religion, is discussed. The value that that person, I mean, the, the value of that person, well, I'll say it's the value of their responsibility, but their, the center is on their responsibility that they have, regardless of their race or religion, to stand against tyranny, ethnic cleansing, I guess we might call it, religious prejudice, demagoguery. And then they're asked to discuss the freedom, the role that the freedom of choice has in a free society. The soul of Germany has been laid bare many, many times since the days of the Second World War. But as each new generation comes along, the people of Germany fear that the young people being born will not understand the depth of the, the error and the hurt that came about because of the principles uh, of the Third Reich. You see, many of those older folks now, in their own lives, they experienced Hitlerism. They experienced the Nazis. They experienced the teaching that Aryan racism was uh, what placed the Germanic peoples and others like them above all other peoples on the earth in their worthiness. They lived through the slaughter of people that just didn't, they didn't believe anyway, measured up. They slaughtered midgets, for instance. Maybe you've seen the film Wizard of Oz and you know the little group of munchkins there that sing in the early parts of the film in the land of Oz. Most of those little munchkins were actually German citizens. And after the filming of The Wizard of Oz, they, many of them, asked for asylum in the United States. And our country denied it, said, no, we will not give you asylum. And we sent them back to Germany and the Nazis decided that to have a pure race, they had to kill all midgets. 
and those people died that you see dancing and singing so merrily in the Wizard of Oz. Then there was a death of over 30 million people in the armed conflict that Germany brought on the world. Over 30 million people. And then there was the merciless butchery of over 6 million Jews who fell before that inflamed hatred that the Nazis had for anyone that didn't measure up to their self-righteous standards. And by the way, I think it should be added for the accuracy of history here in these comments that many of those Jews who died were denied entrance to Great Britain and the United States of America before the public, the general public, was made aware of the carnage that was being brought on those Jews. I personally believe that had the general public been made aware of that as early as some of the information had filtered through to some of our governmental leaders, not all of them, but some of them, that had the general public been made aware, I think we would have had a much faster and caring response as we, and we can say that because of our response after the Second World War in uh, admitting many of them. And yet, even then, as you know, uh, they were an unwanted people, and they wondered where could they go. And that's why so many of them felt that only in Israel could they find refuge, turned away by so many even Western world nations. You know, Hollywood isn't the place to go to for a picture of life that's fit as an example of godly living. Oscar Schindler's decadence is shown in that film. All of the, all too well, in fact, by these masters of filming decadence. And I think Hollywood certainly can be said to be masters of filming decadence. His greed for money at the expense of everything of moral value. His uh, disregard for his wife and marriage in preference for amoral sexual relationships. His embrace of the Nazi ethic, its disregard for human life, its hatred of Jews, its commitment to world domination. He bought into that. But also shown in that film is Schindler's awakened conscience. His recognition of Jews as persons of value, equal to anyone, to himself, to any Nazi. His secret inner commitment to the Jews that he employed in his industry. And ultimately, he came to view their lives as his personal responsibility. In fact, in the film, he calls them my Jews. They're my Jews. And then, finally, his sacrifice of all his worldly wealth to buy the lives of many of those Jews, as many as he could. And then at the very end, that pitiful scene of his remorse at not being able to do more. to save more of them. The scene at the end when the war is over and he realizes that since he was a uh, perpetrator in the war machine of the Nazis, he's going to be sought out and tried and perhaps executed, at least that's the view he had coming upon him. Because indeed, he had uh, manufactured, if you've seen the film or if you know, read the book, he had manufactured uh, armaments 
shells for the Nazis to shoot. However, because his heart had been changed, <laughs> he was proud of the record of his munitions factory. He was proud that not one shell that he had produced could be fired <laughs> because he had deliberately manufactured them out of size so they could not go into the guns that they were being shipped to go into. They were either much too small or much too large, <laughs> and they couldn't use them. So he was proud as the war came to a close that he had frustrated the uh, Nazi uh, our, uh, war machine. But there he was in that last scene thinking, you know, the war is over. I've got to run. I've got to flee for my life. And he's uh, saying goodbye to the, his Jews at his factory. And he actually falls down in the street crying in front of his car. And he looks at the car and he says, why did I keep this car? I could have bought 20 Jews with this car. Why did I keep this coat? And he has a very nice coat on. I could have bought another Jew with my coat. I could have done more. I could have done more. Oscar Schindler is buried on the Mount of Olives outside of Jerusalem. The Jews asked his family to let them bring his body there and bury it in great honor. I visited his grave, and the Jews have a custom that when they visit the grave of someone, to show honor, to show respect, or to show thankfulness for that person's life, they take a small stone and they place it on the stone at the grave, the uh, burial stone that's there that may have the name of the person on it. On Oscar Schindler's grave, there are tens of thousands of little stones placed. So much so that the uh, caretakers for the cemetery have to come and <laughs> scrape them off. And you can see all around his grave site there all the little stones that are there. And then a new crop will start to pile up as people come every day to give honor and thanks that that man lived. I watched that film <clears throat> in Jerusalem in a movie theater entirely populated by Jews, except for the students with me who were Gentiles. <laughs> and as the film went along, I was struck by the fact that there was an absolute silence in that theater. Nobody was talking. That's a long film. And since I don't go to the movie theater as a habit of life, this is a very unusual experience for me. But it was a spiritual experience as I sat there and noted that just the absolute silence, except that silence wasn't so absolute in another way. As the film went along, it was punctuated. One time when a, a German uh, commander was up on a balcony in his apartment looking out on the uh, Jews that were captive in the area below him, the fenced area below him. Just for recreation, he took a rifle and sighted in on one and then shot them to death and then sighted in on another and shot them to death. Little girls, young women, and you could hear with the death of each one a catching of the breath in that theater. People would just go, mm, and they'd wince. And then as the film went along and others were stripped of their clothes and indignities heaped upon them, as they were beaten 
as they were shot down with machine guns, as they were put in the ovens, these people began to just weep. And the whole theater was just filled with weeping and moaning. They knew. They had lived through it. And their parents had lived through it, and their grandparents had lived through it, and, and those younger generations were learning. Now, I have to say personally, that's, as again, that is not a film that will display righteousness. It displays the rawness of life, and they could take about five minutes of gratuitous things out of that film, and it would... I think, allow many more people to feel comfortable watching it, but it's raw and ugly, and there are sexual scenes in it that don't have to be in that film and unnecessary things that are there, but they are a part of that man's life. I know that they were trying to portray him in his debauchery and his absence of moral values, and certainly it comes out. You know, the biblical film that I think Hollywood did the best with in terms of a scene about sin. The film itself is not a good film. It's not even high quality. But there is one good scene that uh, Hollywood did in this film, and that's the film called Sodom and Gomorrah, if you ever get to see it. Uh, there is a place in the film where they show the sins of Sodom and Gomorrah. And I think Hollywood does a marvelous job showing the filth and sin of Sodom and Gomorrah. And they've got uh, homosexuals around, and then they've got prostitutes hanging out the window, and then you can well imagine all the things that are going on. So I, when it comes to sin, Hollywood is great. Of course, when it comes to righteousness, they're not so great. So in showing Oscar Schindler's self-centered debaucheries. They are good. I don't think you have to drag yourself through all of that to understand it or perceive it. I think it could be better handled and the same story told. But the Jewish nation, through its Jewish leaders, have decided uh, by uh, an action, an official action, that they have named now Oscar Schindler a righteous person. A righteous person, as they have for uh, Corey Tenboom. She has been named a righteous person. And what that means for them is that they are declaring that they see this person as one that God will admit into his presence because of the good things he did or she did. What's your view of Jesus? Why do I make that switch? Because I want you to get, a, for a moment here, a view of Oscar Schindler. He have done more. And weeping because he didn't do enough. Is that the view you have of Jesus? Weeping because he didn't do enough? Did he fall short? One who came to save some, is that your view? Some that he had chosen in eternity past, he was going to take to heaven with him. Some that he had given a gift of grace to that made them able to believe. And without that gift, without his action, his unilateral action, that if he hadn't done that, they could not believe and therefore could not receive Christ, therefore could not go to heaven? Is that your view? While he chose to exclude from that purchase price of his blood the greater number, the greater multitude of humanity? You have to remember it was Jesus who said this in Matthew 7. You might want to look at this because he's the one who said it. Matthew 7, 13, by the way, a man could not have said this because God knows these things and he knows every man's heart and, and only God could say this kind of thing. 
Matthew 7, 13, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life, and there are few who find it. That's a statement from the Son of God about the relative numbers of those that go into eternal life versus those that go into eternal damnation. Notice, many, in verse 13, go into the broad gate to destruction. Notice, few, in verse 14, find the way of life. And that would mean, if you would teach and believe that Jesus made that decision and and acted upon that decision for those that should go to heaven, that it was really his decision that only a few, not the many, but the few, should go to heaven and spend eternity with God. And that he shut out the others. And I had asked the question, are there no tears Are there no tears in Jesus for the many? You know, and that turned me to Matthew 23. I mean, if God was going to make that decision, if God was going to determine that only those few would go to heaven, then I have to ask, Why did Jesus lament over Jerusalem when they rejected him? Why did he lament for them? Let's read it. Matthew 23, 37. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her, how often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chickens under her wings, but you were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate, for I say to you that you shall see me no more till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. I want you to look at very closely at this 37th verse again. How often I wanted. That's the will of God now. He wanted. He willed. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks. That's the heart of God, wanting to gather them under his cover, under his wings to draw them close to his breast. And then it says at the end of that verse, but you were not willing. You said no. Your will was against it. My will was for it to happen. Your will was for it not to happen. And I think you have, in one verse, a clear statement, as you do throughout the Word of God, that that ever has been the case. God's heart takes no joy in the death of the wicked. He in no way, in his will, has stopped wanting the unsaved and those who say no He has never stopped wanting them to trust in him. And the responsibility is not upon God for having not made it possible for them to be saved, but upon them because they were not willing. Go to John chapter 8. Um, no, I want to. Let's go to John three. Let's go to John three. 
I'm not going to use John 8 this morning. Let's stay in John 3. I want to read verse 17 again with you. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. You see the knot there? He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That is not part of what God has done. That is not part of God's will. That is not part of God's action. But that the world through him might be saved. The sole purpose of Jesus coming into this world was to save mankind that to make it possible for people to be able to go to heaven. He didn't have to come into this world, if you want to know, in order to condemn people. Do you know why? (laughs) They were already under condemnation because in Adam all die. That's right. That's what the Scripture says. Adam chose to go his own way. And all those born of his race have that same spirit of rebellion, that same spirit now, that fallen nature it's called, that that sin nature. They have that inborn desire to go their own way, not God's way. And the first decision that we knowingly make, knowing good and evil, the first decision we make to go our own way and not God's is called what? The three-letter word starts with S, ends with N, sin. There are a few clues, and you all got it. All right. He did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. But verse 18, again, he who believes in him is not condemned. So the, the Bible is very clear that the key concept that we have to keep in mind is that man is responsible to believe in him if he's going to escape condemnation. But he who does not believe is is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Now, you go a step further and look at verse 19. And this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. I want you to look at the word love. Love is a choice in the Bible. And the fact that men loved darkness means that they made their choice. Man chose to give himself. Love is the the root meaning of the love that we're looking at here is not the liking or the friendship or the sexual side of love. This is entirely that concept of love where one gives of themselves to the good of another, of course, but the concept of giving of yourself is the key to love. Giving, giving, giving. What man gave of himself, what he chose to give of himself, he gave to what? Verse 19, he loved what? Men love darkness. And darkness is a picture of the evil in this world. It's a picture of the lusts of man gone awry. It's uh, uh, gone amok. It's a picture of all that's wrong, all that's sinful, all that's against God. And man chose. He loved it. He chose the darkness. Love is a choice. Love is a choice. And man loved darkness. Remember, love is a choice. Verse 20, another choice. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. Another word that is a word of choice is hate. In the Bible, it doesn't just happen. It doesn't just happen. It comes into our lives by choice. You don't have to hate anybody. In fact, you're admonished by the Lord not to hate, but to love. You're not to hate your enemy. You're to love him. Right? Right. The Bible teaches, and the Lord Jesus teaches then, that hate is a choice. 
And do you know what verse 20 is telling us? That mankind hates? By choice, he hates the light. <laughs> now, the light, we know, speaks of righteousness. It speaks of God. Right? Darkness speaks of sin. It speaks of condemnation. And light speaks of God and righteousness. Man hates righteousness. He loves sin. He hates the light. He loves the darkness. He hates God and loves condemnation. And you say, that's insanity. And that's true. By God's standard of what's normal, that would have to be called insanity. But by man's standard of what's normal, that's called sanity. See? And if, you, if mankind comes in contact with somebody who loves righteousness and hates sin, they think you are a, an unbalanced fanatic. You are not normal. You are not totally sane. See? Got a good collection of nuts here this morning, see? And, and, and what does he say in verse 21? But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen. So here's does. He does the truth. That's choice. That's choice. So when you compare Jesus as he is pictured in the word of God, and God, I speak of Christ as a you know, person of the Godhead, and therefore I speak of God. When you compare God in the Bible to Arthur Schindler, you have to ask yourself, does Jesus weep because he didn't do enough? Does he say, oh, if I had just given a little more blood, if I had given just a little more, if I had done a little more, I could have saved more? Is that the story of the Bible? No. What did he give? Oh, could he give more? There's no more he could give. He gave his life. He gave his blood. He gave his all. He gave his infinite love. He has not held back. There is nothing in this Bible that teaches that God holds back his love. God holds back his action based on that love. He has done everything he can. Short of taking over your will. He will not do that. Not because he couldn't, but he will not. Because love would not be possible if you didn't make the choice yourself. Not according to the Bible's understanding of love. And God wants our love. He wants us to choose him. He loves us and gave his son. Jesus paid with his blood a ransom price that was not according to silver and gold, Peter says. Far beyond what Jesus teaches in Mark 8, 36, encompasses the whole world. What shall a man give? He says, if a man gain the whole world and lose his own soul, what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? If he gave the whole world, would it be enough? No, Jesus is saying it's not enough. If he gave the whole universe, would it be enough? No, it wouldn't be enough. If he gave all of creation, and that means all light, all darkness, and all physical things that are within it, would that be enough? And the answer from the scripture is no, that wouldn't be enough. But Jesus gave enough. He gave all. He gave himself. He has no tears for himself. He does not cry and weep and say, I didn't do enough. His tears, his laments, are for those that say no to what he wants. He wants to gather them together like chickens under the wings of a hen. But they say no. 
John says in the first chapter, he came to his own things, his own created things, and his own people would not receive him. But as many as received him, now to them he gave the right to be what? Children of God. And here you are with John the baptizer coming as a forerunner of Christ to tell Israel about him. And he comes before them and his disciples see that Jesus is getting to be more famous than John and they're upset. He says, well, that one that you testified to, he's baptizing more people than you are. And they have to learn a lesson. As John gives it to them in one little statement in verse 30, he must increase, I must decrease. He gave his all for me. Now what am I supposed to do? Let all that I am point to him, add to him, bring honor to him, give glory to him, and get my my eyes, my values off of me. See, that's what happened in a kind of way, in a, in a type for Oscar Schindler. He lost those old values that Jews were worth nothing, and he finally he put great value on them and came to love them and gave everything he had for them. But the Bible has a greater story. Jesus loved us. He never had any other value. He always loved us. Even from the foundation of the world, he's, he's, he's the lamb slain. Before he created anything, he was willing to come and die for us. He always loved us, and he gave all for us. And his tears are not because he's failed. His tears are because we fail to come to him. Now, those of us that know him as Savior say, well, Lord, I've come. But the Lord is still in his heart hurt for the many that don't. And do you know what he wants us to do? Stop centering our, our eyes and our lives on self, but take up his vision of giving all. And let self decrease and let Christ increase by taking up his love for the world. Be his voice, be his body, be his hand to go to reach them. The people around you, the people at school, the people at work, the neighbors, uh, those you contact, those that you just meet in uh, instances of life as they come across, little children, older people, in the nursing homes, in the hospitals, that you come across in the course of life. He must increase. I must decrease. They've got to hear that he loves them and he gave everything for them and he doesn't want them to reject him. And I've got to get that message out by decreasing and letting his love be seen. I know we all have that battle. We're going to have it till we die. But his love is perfect and that's what he asks of us. And you have to dedicate yourself afresh every day like John the Baptist, I must decrease. He must increase. I've got to make him known. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for giving all for us. Your life, your blood, your all. And thank you that we have salvation as a gift. And that you would use us if we would give our all every day. You would use us to reach this world, the ones you love, the ones you weep for. And though we know ahead of time that most of them, the many, will say no, Lord, use us to reach even the few, if we count by numbers compared to those that reject, to reach those that would respond, Lord, might we be faithful.
might we be willing to decrease so that you can be seen. In Jesus' name. Alrighty, so there we have it. Thank you, Pastor, for another message from the Word of God. And uh, thank you, Fellowship Bible Church, for uh, allowing me to to bring these tapes to you, because they have an awful lot of them. And I just wanted to say thank you, listeners, for listening in on all of these uh, tapes that I do every week. I'm glad to I'm glad to do them, but. I just, you know, appreciate people actually listening to them because then it seems like I'm not wasting my time. There's just there, there are people out there that are actually listening to it. So you got to listen. First, you got to listen. Then you got to what? Learn, right? You learn from them. And then what do you do? I always say it. Share. That's right. Listen, learn, and then share what you learned. And share the podcast with your friends and with your family and with anyone you come in contact with. Because that's how it grows. And our listenership is growing. Every day I see a, a new state or a new country pick up uh, in the pick up the ham, uh, ham fest. <laughs> I don't know why I'm thinking ham fests. Uh, no, it picks up the, uh, the podcast. And I'm glad to have it. Glad to have you so Welcome aboard, whoever you are. If you want me to know who you are, send me a comment. I'd love to hear your comments. You can go to their website, and there's a, a comment uh, box at the bottom. That's at uh, LegacyBiblePodcast.com. And there's a comment box at the bottom of there. You just have to put your e uh, email address in and your uh, your message, and that'll get right to me. So thanks for listening, and uh, hopefully we'll have another one next week. <laughs> I think we will, because lately I've been doing these ahead, like this one, which is going to be coming out in September. Um, I'm actually, see, it's like August right now, so I'm actually making it in August. So I'm trying to get ahead. I think I got my process down so that I could just, you know, put them out quicker. That way I can get ahead. That way there's not much of a of a hurry trying to uh, create more podcasts so that they come out for the, for the next week. I'm not in such a hurry. I'll be ahead. And also, because I want to have uh, a second podcast, which if you want, you can go and listen to. It's right now it's on Spotify. It's on Apple Podcast. It's my Truth From Tape podcast. And that's going to feature the uh, the tape recordings that I have from the Cicero Bible Church. I decided to make a special channel just for that. So that's where they're going to be at. And they're all going to be on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and YouTube. So you could check that out, Truth From Tape. So that would be good if you did. So, all right, then. I thank you for listening. And I'll see you again next week. And remember, share, share, share. And have a great day. <laughs>